Welcome to Nerds at Church, a podcast about nerdery and the Bible. I'm Pastor Kay, and I use pronouns like she and her. And I'm Pastor Emily, and my pronouns are they, them, theirs. And my name is Alejandro Wilgertis. I go by Ale. Uh, my pronouns are they and he. In this episode, we'll discuss the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, also known as Proper 9 or Lectionary 14, which this year falls on July 3rd. We have a few content notifications for this episode. We talk about settler colonialism in the deep dive, abortion access kind of sprinkled throughout the episode, and violence against protesters in the second reading. Check out the episode description for links to the Bible passages and other references we make in this episode. For our deep dive into labor justice and organizing this episode, we have a special guest, Ale Murguya Ortiz, who was born and raised in Sioux City, Iowa, and is the son of immigrant meatpacking workers. They have been politically active for nearly their entire life, attending their first protest for immigrants' rights at eight years old. In response to COVID-19 outbreaks in the meatpacking industry and the murder of George Floyd by police, he has spent the last two years organizing full-time around immigrant rights, workers' rights, and racial justice across Iowa. Welcome! (laughs) Thank you. We're so glad to have you here. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So, Ali, your current job is as the community organizer for Iowa Migrant Movement for Justice. Can you tell us some about what you do for that? Yeah. Uh, So, you know, as mentioned in my bio, um, I started organizing around meatpacking. Essentially, you know, I would say pretty organically. I mean, even at the time, I wasn't really, I didn't really know that what I was doing was organizing. It was just like I was talking to workers and my family, uh, my extended family works in the industry uh, to this day. Um, Mm -hmm. And as do the the families of my childhood friends, even my brother-in-law who lives in a completely different, you know, part of Iowa, his his dad also uh, works in the industry. So it's, you know, a pretty uh, big industry in Iowa across the board. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so I... Was, of course, seeing folks that I knew, um, very concerned, especially at the beginning of, of COVID, uh, regarding, you know, what was happening in the meatpacking plants um, and, you know, wasn't seeing uh, decision makers, leadership, or really the media at the time, uh, really speaking to what was happening or even showing concern for what could be happening. And, well, mm-hmm. um, of course, myself and, and several others um, in a similar situation, mainly the, 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 the children of, of these workers, we, you know, started to kind of create spaces online and just start like advocating for what was happening or trying to talk to workers and figure out what the deal was like why like you know how many folks were sick where's where are the outbreaks happening and you know from there we're able to elevate you know what was happening and and get you know we got of course a lot of um you know media coverage um and such but really the most important piece that i think really happened was that like organizing piece the organizing pieces so whether that was, you know, organizing simply to help people getting a hold of their human resources so they can get paid mm-hmm. or so they can know what they need to do, um, you know, or essentially when, um, you know, just talking to workers about, you know, what they were being told and what they were doing in, in the plants, like what they were or weren't allowing. There was a certain point where they weren't allowing folks to bring masks in some of these mm-hmm. plants. Yeah. So it was, of course, you know, that that really got me more involved and that's how I joined um, the team now Iowa Migrant Movement for Justice at the time American Friends Service Committee Iowa um, and just Iowa Justice for Our Neighbors and that's that's how I met Erica who's the the director um, and how I met a lot of folks in, including Emily and um, you know just uh, you know from there that became an opportunity to organize full-time um, you know there was I'd say luckily an, an opportunity that, you know, I honestly wouldn't have thought could exist <laughs> to be able to do organizing in what I consider a pretty radical like space and mm-hmm. uh, being able to do it in a way that doesn't that I don't feel like I'm being limited or, um, you know, directed by, you know, funders or, you know, whomever wants to, I guess, have their hands or their say in, you know, the issues that we work on, which, of course, is largely workers' rights, um, and in particular Mm -hmm. in immigrant spaces, and more 
uh, against broadly just uh, immigrants' rights as a whole. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that provides immigration legal services and advocacy. We have several folks that are either DOJ credit reps or lawyers um, who help mm-hmm. folks, you know, across Iowa, um, you know, navigate the various uh, immigration processes. And was obviously observed was that you know it's almost like you know the the work gets harder in in, in immigration legal services because the laws aren't changing because Mm -hmm. the work isn't being done um you know at least in particular here in iowa to truly uh change the systems and how they uh serve or protect or whatever they want to say that um you know our systems are there for our communities, but, you know, change it into a way that is actually making sure that folks aren't being separated from their families, aren't being stripped from their homes, um, Mm -hmm. and are being taken advantage of in their workplaces because of the leverage that they have based on these circumstances and their status and whatever it is that they want to use to, you know, essentially hold this power over workers. So that means, of course, organizing with workers. That means... Um, advocating for local, state, federal laws. Um, That means showing up, you know, for black lives as, you know, understanding the intersectionalities of the various issues and how they affect and impact uh, different segments of our communities and um, ensuring that, you know, we don't lose uh, sight of that given that largely all of these issues are affecting our communities and if we're not protecting um, immigrants um, in this way too, then, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, vulnerabilities in, in how uh, the system can continue to take advantage and act violence on our communities. Yeah, I remember I was like aware of immigrants' worker rights because of my dad worked in construction growing up and then opened a store with some of the guys he worked in construction with. But it was in college, my junior year, right after classes were over, I was in Decorah, Iowa, which is in northeastern Iowa, and it was 2008, and that was when they did the Postville raid Mm. in Iowa, and so the next year, I was working with some of the people who were released on, like, humanitarian reasons, so they had family that were dependent on them, but also they were, like, released and not allowed to work, Mm -hmm. and so it was this, like, weird dynamic, but part of what all of that that came out during that was there was a lot of folks who then applied for part- this particular type of visa, and I don't remember what it's called, but it's if you are experiencing abuse or mm-hmm. in your workplace and you're undocumented, you can apply for this visa to protect you while you like file a complaint or whatever about the abuse. So that's when it started to come out like how much abuse had been happening in the meatpacking plant in Postville, Iowa because they could like you said right they could hold over well you're undocumented so if you don't do what we say we can just call immigration customs enforcement Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. so all it sounds like you did have a a very organic process to getting from just having opinions to becoming a literal professional in the field now (laughs) but i suppose most of our listeners won't actually wind up being able to get full-time jobs organizing so can you tell us a little bit more about your journey from growing up and and knowing uh, all of these things about uh, the lives of the workers to actively volunteering and and taking a more active role yeah definitely and it's of course it's like a very complicated you know situation in where you know i think this is something that to some extent a lot of families from you know who struggled growing up kind of experience but it's something that i know a lot of the children of immigrants kind of go through which is you know that that desire to i don't know i mean i guess it could it could manifest itself in in different ways but whether that's like oh i need to get a job that is gonna make so much money so that i can you know give back to my parents and make sure that you know you know what they did to get here is is worth whatever this country deems to be i guess uh worth anything which largely sure. seems to be having uh, capital and and money and you know some job that is i guess considered i i don't even know exactly how to say it but it's uh you know something that was difficult to navigate growing up you know considering like oh what what do mm-hmm. i need to do to like take care of myself and my family and then also while at the same time seeing 
first of all, like how uh, society treats, uh, how Iowa treats, how uh, at that time my member of my congressperson, you know, Steve King, you know, spoke about my family and, you know, so it was, you know, clear that there were, you know, especially even as a, I mean, even as a kid, as, as was mentioned, you know, I, I attended my first march when I was like eight, you know, this was Bush era, this was, um, you know, really when there was a lot of fears of, you know, a lot mm-hmm. of talk of wall, it was a lot of talk of, you know, even, uh, you know, of course, just deportation and just a lot of hate that was you know happening you know a lot across the country as well as you know continuing um as i you know developed as i grew um and you know of course my own personal experience with that and and with racism and with uh, xenophobia um into college where i you know was able to kind of um find spaces where i could talk about these issues because that wasn't really a thing that existed growing up now whether that's because I, I you know it's it's hard for me to really compare when i was in high school versus like students in high school now it's really interesting to see that dynamic and the spaces that exist for mm-hmm. students to talk about their identity to talk about um you know all of the issues that are you know actively impacting us and our families um mm-hmm. but then also you know to, to speak with my family with my parents it really wasn't a conversation that uh, they wanted to have and not because they didn't know what was happening because they, that they didn't know what they were experiencing and that it needed to change but rather you know they there's you know this sense of um, wanting to protect us from that and from mm-hmm. the knowing how their hands and their knees are being deteriorated by the constant work that they're forced to do for extended hours for low pay for forced weekends um seeing their co-workers and they themselves get injured on the job because of lack of safety and protections to even what you know they were aware of in terms of you know the how either they or other immigrants are treated treated uh just in general so you know of course as i you know grew older i started to see that for myself and you know start to question what that what my parents were and weren't communicating to us and talking to my siblings about that and you know getting a a better sense for for that without having to have that conversation but without having that conversation it, it it did you know it was a to some extent, it's a little process in like knowing what to do with that information and how to take action. And you know, of course, in college, I was able to take action on other things and kind of learn what it is to show up, um, to organize, to build relationships in in this way around things that we care about, and um, know that there can be spaces where you will be you'll be able to talk about that and you'll be able to feel safe being. Um, you know, having radical thought. So I entered college, you know, wanting to make money, thinking that, you know, like, that's what's gonna create, like, freedom for my parents, because I know what they were struggling with, and it was lack of money. And so I, I started, uh, you know, I went to college as an accounting major, and was gonna do that. (laughs) Yep. I quickly realized that wasn't for me, I'll be honest. Um, <laughs> and, you know, honestly, business school, they don't talk about this, but business school is pretty radicalizing because, like, you realize that it's... Yeah. And you're like, oh, they're saying these things, but, like, that doesn't seem to be what's happening, like, out mm-hmm. in the world. So I'm curious about why they're still saying it. Uh, <laughs> yep. But, <laughs> you know, and I, and I finished college not really even caring too much about the degree I had, which was at the time information systems, but really knowing that, like, like I, you know, I need to finish this, whatever, I'm almost done, but, like, there's more that can be done that's, mm-hmm. like, going to directly help folks. And I didn't know at the time exactly what that meant either. You know, I was very much interested in kind of uh, the nonprofit world, which... I think is also sometimes a bit of a trap uh, when it comes mm-hmm. to like taking this work in the right direction um, and yeah. could have been a sure. very bad trap if I would have maybe gone in the wrong with the wrong organization I think mm-hmm. um, but you know I, I did end up working for a nonprofit for a little bit that you know was doing interesting things in research in politics and such and you know I was able to gain a lot of just knowledge about how the political system worked uh, which has been you know 
pretty helpful in, Mm -hmm. you know, being able to navigate a lot of these conversations, um, as well as, you know, whatever experience is um, necessary to, you know, go into other work, especially if you're not really using your degree. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was it was slow. I, after that, I realized. I mean, I was working in a in not making money. I was not yeah. paid very well at all, and found myself in a very like dark moment in my life. And whether not just because of like being not having enough you know funds to for for myself, but just you know it was a tox- toxic work environment where my you know direct leadership was honestly very like verbally abusive and that in and of itself can like really like push down a lot of that like uh motivation and like strength that you have to take action and to like want to be um in these spaces and and for a bit i i pulled in the other direction of just not being involved and you know went into the private sector for a while but 2020 hit and that wasn't an option like yeah. uh, especially because I found myself in such a place of privilege to be able to be in a job where I was, you know, if my employer cared enough, I could have done it. I could do it at home. I could be isolated and, you know, be in, even if I wasn't, it was still a lot safer than whatever conditions I knew my parents were in. And that's yeah. where it was, you know, I was at the time willing to risk whatever income I had and the job I had to, um, you know, spend my time where I thought was most useful, which was protecting people in whatever way I could, or at least attempting to, at least attempting to advocate so that, you know, this didn't continue the way it did. And so it was a a, a journey that was, you know, honestly surprising throughout and like something I didn't, I don't think I could have planned for in any way, but, you know, was... Uh, I think very lucky and um, but also I think it did a lot at the time to I guess um, to 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 land in in this in the spot where I am now yeah sure well and it's I know I've heard from other immigrants as well and like particularly read in books of (laughs) like fiction by immigrants about immigrants that pressure and the the like steps of generational right like to have parents who are immigrants who are working minimum wage jobs, who are working meatpacking plant, like those sorts of jobs that are very hard labor. And they like there are hopes and dreams that they have. Like there's a reason why they're doing that work. And it is largely for their kids mm-hmm. to give their kids the opportunities. And so then there's an additional pressure, right? There yeah. is that extra pressure to make enough money, not only because you care about them and you want to support them, and alleviate some of the burdens that they have, but also because it is their hope for you. Yeah. And we just happen to live in, you know, late stage capitalism, but where mm. everything's a dystopian hellscape. <laughs> and, and honestly, <laughs> you know, and and not in uh, an intrusive way, but there was there was also some like actual pressure from you know, say my dad to find that type of role, and you know now sure. that's kind of got away given you know that i've been able to like demonstrate what other options there are to be able to you know survive (laughs) Mm -hmm. but it was something you know going to high school that you know especially as someone that you know they saw as like doing well in school like oh you know i could go and like do all these things and make all this money because you know they're smart and they do well in school and there's all these Mm -hmm. things and you know that that pressure on top of everything else you know understandably they're like what if what if you did this though yeah yeah so on a practical level when it comes to educating people do you find yourself talking about some things more often maybe are there like a couple of labor laws that seem to just come up all the time or uh, that kind of thing that you would want people to know about yeah i mean the the biggest thing especially given like how i got involved the biggest thing is osha um in in terms of like what was very obviously a problem is was that let's say there was unsafe working conditions Um, There was an outbreak, whatever it was that was happening. Complaints were filed. OSHA would call up the Iowa OSHA in particular, which, um, you know, I'll I'll talk a little bit about the dynamic there, but um, would call up the company and be like, hey, we heard this was happening. And then the company would say, no. And they'd be like, okay, then cleared. Everything's good. And, you know, you can... Super helpful. 
Yeah, you can blame, you know, understaffing, you can blame whatever funding limitations, which, you know, I'm sure to some extent, like, they probably need more. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they definitely need more funding, they need more uh, capacity and all of that, but that in and of itself is a problem, mm-hmm. but also just in general, the fact that not even attempts were made um, is really frustrating, and, um, you know, Iowa OSHA ha- is different from a lot of other states because it is a state kind of, like, uh, a state level version of the federal OSHA so they uh, in theory would have the bare minimum of what federal OSHA you know regulates and does and then whatever they choose to do also so you know it, it it doesn't sound like a bad system to be able to do that to like essentially be the same and then be able to do more but it it, it very much doesn't seem that uh in the state you know especially in the state like iowa that you know it's being taken seriously by our legislature uh, by any like the folks in the system Mm -hmm. right now and um how they work with like the federal osha as well who was also largely absent yeah i mean i remember the like organizing around bills that would be introduced into the state legislature during the pandemic to try to get protections and rights and mm-hmm. and they just like yeah. organize it. I think organizing is particularly hard when there are people who don't bend to any kind of pressure from people. And I have to say also that the idea that the regulatory organization's first step is to call the company and quite literally ask, hey, did you do a crime? <laughs> Does not sound like the most effective method oh, of enforcing right? laws. Like, like I, don't... <laughs> I don't claim to be an expert, but that just does not sound useful to me. I... <laughs> But who would know, right? Everyone. Everyone would know. <laughs> like, literally everyone except for them. <laughs> Um, I would say another, like, really big issue that I would definitely, like, throw out there as, you know, ongoing, especially in meat industry, in food processing, is really the line speeds. And how that relates to OSHA is that OSHA, at least from my understanding, says they're unable to do anything about that. Uh, It's USDA regulations, from my understanding. It's more about the food safety than it is about the worker safety. Um, So the... Or... mm, (laughs) Say food safety or you know food regulation whatever it is that you know they want to prioritize like whatever you know that's that's the most important piece uh to them and i i guess you know it's something that like literally we've heard before the pandemic through the of the pandemic um and and it's an issue that is ongoing that you know line speeds just get faster and faster um and that is incredibly dangerous and you know again something that we hear about almost every day yeah yeah that's Considering the USDA regulates like cheese, right? Like the the regulation, the food regulations are just like a little bit questionable. Period. And I'm a vegetarian, so like the meat regulations, I'm not familiar with. But I do know that there are cheeses that I cannot buy in this country <laughs> because it's this country. But they weren't readily available in other countries, yeah. and like. So this idea of, and I like that you shifted, right? Instead of food safety, it's food regulations, some of which are to keep food safe and sanitary and all of that. Yeah. But also, like, we've seen in, for farm workers and stuff too, right? Like, when worker conditions are not safe, when there are not opportunities to go to the bathroom places or other things, like, that has impacts on the safety of the food as well. Like, to think that, like, lettuce has E. coli on it or whatever just because, like, that's how it grows? Like, no, there is, like, worker safety and that impacts the food safety there, so. And let's just say in a lot of the workers that will not touch the food that they they process, so. Yeah. I believe it, yeah. If you could tell one thing to everyone who is an employee in the U.S. so that they can better protect themselves, uh, what would you want that to be? Um, I would say talk about work, at work, after work, anywhere, organize, and more specifically, I would say that you as a worker deserve ownership over your labor, Um, and Mm -hmm. I mean that literally. (laughs) I mean (laughs) that you deserve ownership over what you produce, and like in terms of like the profits that you generate for your employer, 
And if that means organizing with your workers to unionize, whether that means organizing your workers to your with your coworkers to essentially, uh, <laughs> let's say, buy out the your mm-hmm. employer, um, or you know, start off start off a co-op um, in the space in your expertise in which you as workers can collectively own what you produce and how that's you know created developed and distributed or simply like i said you know working towards creating some form of um, union within your workplace Um, but i would say uh, make sure that in that in that work that you're doing that because like what is difficult about labor in iowa is that a lot of those spaces are not safe for marginalized communities Mm -hmm. and you know it's a difficult conversation to have uh, but it is one that's really needed and important so even if there is a union in your workplace and you feel that you aren't being taken care of, organize outside of whatever systems or structures you feel are directing or are uh, facilitating the dangerous or bad conditions or unfair pay or whatever conditions it is that you're fighting against. Yeah, yeah. I think about that and there's been a huge increase in the number of unions Mm-hmm. or in the number of people voting to unionize this yeah. year compared to last year, last year, I think, compared to the year before. And a lot of it that I follow because of who is in my household <laughs> is Starbucks, right? Yeah. Again and again. And that's a particular, like, groups of people who are able to have Starbucks jobs. But there's also, like, I think about teachers, and particularly teachers in Iowa who are not allowed to strike. Yeah. who are not allowed to do, legally allowed to do the things that they need to do to get better pay mm-hmm. and those sorts of things. So they, they're allowed to have a union, but the union isn't able to do everything it has because the laws have been changed yeah. to make it harder. I mean, even in the meatpacking, I mean, it's like, well, like if you look back at 2020 where those outbreaks really happened, I can't find a single difference between the, the places that were unionized and weren't in terms of how... Mm-hmm how bad they got hit or, you know, what the timeline was for implementing changes. And it's upsetting because I'll be frank, I I attempted to contact a lot of them and some of those, some of the locals were unwilling to collaborate with the community to advocate for the workers. Like, I don't want to say that they didn't do anything because I wasn't in their whatever meetings that they had. But at the end of the day, a lot of people were, a lot of people died and they could have done something about it. Yeah. So the flip side of this is yes. what would you say to every employer to support their employees? Um, I mean, I guess I'll keep it at... <laughs> <laughs> right, this is a hard quit, one, quit your, right? Quit your job? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, uh, not murdering people sounds like uh-huh, a start. That is a start. Beyond that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's a lot I could say. I mean, from literally decentralize your company and give power to the workers to make the decisions. But at the bare minimum, put them on your board. These, like, a lot of the workers, like, literally know what the f*** they're doing. Sorry, I cuss. Uh, <laughs> it's okay, you get to be R2-D2 now. Like, it's great. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, no, I mean, a lot of the workers, especially, you know, we're talking agriculture, meat packing. So many of these workers, like, literally came from places that are very similar to what Iowa is right now in terms mm-hmm. of, like, the industries and know what they're talking about, know what they're doing, and could do it in a way that, like, literally is <laughs> sustainable. Could you imagine? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can you imagine if, you know, folks were able to practice what they're familiar with? And what it's just the our natural way of uh, creating uh, like food and resources in a mm-hmm. sustainable way that isn't some like really gross huge industry that is destroying every piece of our planet and um, displacing yeah. families here and abroad because of like the impacts that it has and the power that the industries have on other countries and their land and their resources and it's mm-hmm. it's. Like, honestly, you know, give the land back, give the profits back, and, like, just at the bare minimum, give them, like, power over their their labor. Yeah. Yeah. You're alluding to, right, give the land back. Yes. Alludes to the movement for a lot of indigenous groups, particularly in this country, but 
that's what we're talking about, right? Like when we talk about people know how to grow this stuff, people know how to do this work more sustainably. A lot of that is because they are indigenous to particular areas, even if they are immigrants to this country, to the United States, a lot of folks are indigenous to other places and Mm -hmm. native people have been caring for the earth, right? Like when white settlers came to this gun to this land it wasn't that the land was just whatever it was that it was actively cultivated in sustainable ways by native Mm -hmm. peoples and that knowledge despite settler colonialism's best efforts has actually been passed down and continues to be knowledge and wisdom that everyone would benefit from Mm -hmm. but it requires giving the land back giving them giving the land back back here giving the land back in mexico and central america where Mm -hmm. uh, or like literally leaving the industry as a whole like we as a country have like such a chokehold on the uh the the corn industry that like honestly shouldn't really even be that big of an industry here like it if if you think about like the 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 Mm -hmm. true like agriculture of iowa you know especially the magnitude that it that we have it at it, 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 that with you know with NAFTA and with just like how the industry developed just obliterated the corn industry in Mexico and Central America that was a staple food that was a you know and where right now fo- the corn in Mexico is mostly imported from the U.S. and like literally like corn yeah. was <laughs> everywhere in my mom's hometown. Yeah. It yep. was all around us, and that's how folks sustain themselves, and they can't anymore because there's no market for them to enter. Yeah. So what dreams do you have for labor justice in this country? <laughs> well, right. I would like to see an organized labor, and by that I mean like the current uh, institutional organized labor move away from its current uh, models and its current practices and acknowledge that it took like radical socialist unions and leaders to get us where we are and it took i guess i I think back to just like a few weeks ago was you know justice for janitors day and that just reminds me Mm -hmm. of like the very clear outcomes of taking up space doing direct action as labor organizers as a labor movement and being um, violently attacked by police in the state and remembering that that's what's going to happen if we ever actually do something worth doing for your workers like that's what's going to happen and if we continue to be as close as labor seems to be at least in particular here in iowa with law enforcement and police and continuing Mm. to to essentially ignore calls from you know our communities to end those relationships and instead they you know advocate for for them a lot more loudly at least i've seen than you know some of our other industries and unwilling to uh, honestly even show up for black lives i don't think i saw labor in 2020 i'll be honest mm. like maybe i saw a few folks but i'm not sure if i saw them yeah i saw people who were part of unions exactly. there but yes. not as part of unions, which is yeah. like a tricky thing that it the church organized. the church does this too, right? Like where we care for congregations and stuff. We care for members that are like hospitalized or whatever through parishioners, but it's not organized as like, this is the church caring. Like there is a different impact when it is the organization saying, yeah. these people yeah. are here representing us. These mm-hmm. people are here because we are here. Because that's that's what was happening during a lot of those very radical like m- movements that that mm-hmm. that that labor loves to talk about <laughs> uh, I mean that uh, we we remember so fondly but are unwilling to go back and um, recycle some of those really good tactics and so but what I would like to see honestly is also really a shift in the direction of worker ownership and whether that's co-ops, whether that's, you know, whatever, however that manifests itself, but in a way where there isn't some CEO or some hierarchical system that is essentially making the calls for the workers who are the true experts in, you know, the work that they're doing. I would love to see, um, and, and I, I honestly, like, I'm seeing folks here want to, 
especially seeing, you know, Starbucks and seeing all, like, what is happening, I am seeing, like, there is interest in, like, all right, like, let's do that here. And I'm in conversation mm-hmm. with folks here, um, you know, to try to help them unionize, you know, their coffee shop or where, you know, their workplace. And um, that's, that's what I want to see. I would love to see. Uh, my dream is that the workers own their labor and in whatever way they want to, um, you know, do that. Um, but, you know, one where folks are unified and to, and ready to respond to issues that maybe aren't specific to labor, maybe are also showing up for reproductive justice, maybe are also, um, you know, showing up for, for immigrant workers. <laughs> mm-hmm. Can you imagine? That would be amazing. <laughs> and that, that, that's truly what, what I would love to see um, at the bare minimum. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason why we chose this topic today uh, is because in our gospel reading, Jesus sends out the 70 disciples uh, to minister and to heal the sick. And when he does this, he sends them out and he instructs them not to take any extra stuff with them. Just uh, take what they're wearing. Don't take a purse. Don't take an extra bag. And uh, the people that they go to will provide for them is the expectation. And in the world of biblical hospitality, that was not completely socially unacceptable for hi- him to do. Yeah, pretty reasonable. The arrival of uh, unexpected people and new laborers to a neighborhood was not quite as extraordinary as it would be to us because you know we would expect to hear that people were coming on social media (laughs) we would uh, expect to uh, to have some planning ahead for this kind of thing especially if you're you know planning for 70 people (laughs) but you know in the ancient world they didn't have facebook and so they uh, organized in a different way Uh, and part of that was a social expectation (laughs) of Jesus on TikTok would be very That amazing. would be amazing. There have been some good Jesus TikToks. Yeah. But their organizing was on the basic cultural expectation of hospitality, mm-hmm. uh, which is what provided for the disciples in this case. But uh, that led Emily and I to asking ourselves, is Jesus practicing labor justice? Like, we couldn't get away with this in our world now, but, like, was it just back then? We're educated somewhat in the ancient world but we don't claim to be uh, fabulous experts of it so like h- how could jesus have been practicing labor justice a little better about this <laughs> and how would this you know go down in enormous flames in today's world wow <laughs> right <laughs> i mean yeah i <laughs> i'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> Like, if an employer did this today, yes. it, that, that would fly. definitely be something we'd all wind up organizing against, I'm guessing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, that is, that's a tough one. I don't know if I have a good answer. It's, yeah. yeah. Well, so the additional com- complicated thing, right, is basically all of the disciples, uh-huh. before they met Jesus, were doing, like, basic subsistence, like, day-to-day, mm-hmm. if you don't get paid today, if the catch of fish is not good today, you're screwed for tomorrow kind mm-hmm. of life. Yeah. PTO was not really an option. Yeah. yeah. So I, I do wonder, though, like, is this actually an improvement to say instead of having to rely only on yourself in a system of economic exploitation, is it actually like more hopeful, more just, more fruitful to rely on hospitality in a deeply hospitable context. I mean, neither of them like are guarantees of anything, and Jesus right. is very clear about like never guaranteeing anybody like prosperity. But yeah. Hmm. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, I guess I just um, my brain always just goes like just uh, collective action, collective ownership. If folks, you know, if <laughs> I don't know, but like you can uh, together come up with, I think, solutions rather than like um, expect um, solutions, I guess, like from how do I say it? I'm struggling with this one, but organizations, that's good. Like from the boss, from the boss. It's <laughs> it's like, you know, if collectively, I mean, first of all, like not everyone is going to have the exact same experience solutions or ideas or you know, know how. And so, mm-hmm. you know, maybe it's uh, it's still not going to be easy, but I think having a, a, a some form of consensus and 
decision making process where you're collectively like catching the fish and figuring out what to do with it. Uh, <laughs> I think that may, maybe that'll be uh, maybe that would have um, been a, a cool way to see how that transpired. Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love that question, though. <laughs> no, it's great. Um, it, it's a big question. Uh, it's a level of mutual aid that we're just not used to anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even like the mutual aid groups. I mean, I was mutual aid groups. I know I experienced after our arrest, like there were physical therapists, there were therapists, there were people bailing people out. There are now community fridges. There's, I think I saw there's abortion and and contraception Mm -hmm. organizations that have since come up. Like it's starting to move into that direction. The tricky part is that like that actually shouldn't replace the government taking care of all of those things as well. But to to see that shift back into much deeper community care is really, yeah. that was one of the most encouraging things, I think, for me in Iowa, at least. Yeah, it's been really yeah. great to see. Well, and given recent events, I would want to include a comment that recently we've seen a, a wave of people posting on Facebook about, oh, you know, I have a couch and I know where the nearest clinic is, and followed by a wave of people posting, please do not share your intention to do a crime on Facebook, <laughs> followed by a wave of people posting, please also keep in mind that some of the people who are offering this aid are probably not doing it with good intentions and may in fact intend to browbeat you Mm -hmm. and worse when you show up mutual aid is wonderful but you have to work with people who have been at this for a while and know what they're doing and are trusted by by good people not just random people on the internet i mean i think of the sanctuary movement right and the ways that the sanctuary movement has worked particularly with and for immigrants and there is the strategy of public stuff and the strategy of private stuff and i know i have been one of the people who said like I have a couch and Maryland has abortion access. Yeah. That was all I said about that part. Mm-hmm. And I think like particularly for those of us who are who have more public identities, right? I as a pastor yeah. have a public identity. And so there's a, there's a certain aspect of trust, particularly as a queer mm-hmm. and non-binary pastor mm-hmm. where I can like yeah. situate myself and I have the connections where like if somebody did reach out to me, that is immediately going off of social media. Mm-hmm. And yeah. we're having a conversation in private and we're figuring stuff out, like, right. hypothetically. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it's like this navigation and like, how do you navigate this? And there are people who have been doing this already. So how are you connecting to the people who have been doing it? The mutual aid networks that are already established, the mm-hmm. abortion t- railroads to get people sure. to clinics and those sorts of things. Ale, did you have anything else you wanted to throw in about labor justice before we jump into the readings? I mean, the the, the biggest pieces of um, you know, where I think it needs to go, and in particular here in Iowa, it's tough for me to talk about other states, um, especially mm-hmm. seeing just such like great stuff that's happening in, in yeah. other places. But um, yeah, I mean, I think regardless, like if you work somewhere, even if you work in a nonprofit, if you work anywhere, like unionize. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, when you were talking about nonprofit work, I was like, "Oh, nonprofit work can be some of the worst because you're doing it for a greater yeah. purpose, and therefore that means you should not get paid." I mean, just looking at Planned Parenthood right now, and uh, here in Iowa and in the mm-hmm. yeah, the <clears throat> these Midwest surrounding and... states, yeah. Yep. I mean, what's coming from leadership, and and really during this time, I mean, I can imagine. Like, I'm not saying that they are doing this, but I can imagine feeling some kind of pressure to not you know create you know to not like unionize or not to be doing this at this time because of what's happening so it's it, it's pretty i mean especially talking to the the workers that i know at planned parenthood and like yeah. the dynamics like it's it's tough but it's there's a lot of pressure in the nonprofit industry to, to not even even organizations that claim to be in favor of like labor justice mm-hmm. yeah yeah which is bad like i want to be like no this is exactly the time like Mm-hmm. for Planned Parenthood to not just like allow unions and like stop trying to union best but like to actively say yes we believe in unions mm-hmm. yeah and we believe that we are better together right when reproductive justice and labor justice 
work together. Intersectional work, thank you, Kimberly Crenshaw, is always better. Yeah. Yeah. Our first reading for this episode is from Isaiah chapter 66, verses 10 through 14. On returning from exile, restoring Israel was not as easy as the exiles had hoped. The prophet Isaiah reminds the people that they are loved and supported by the mothering figures of Jerusalem, their heritage, and God. So one of the themes that I noticed in this passage, which I particularly love to point out because so frequently we don't pay attention to um, more feminine images for God, but this is very much God as a motherly figure. They love this space of God as a motherly figure. Then it made me, it reminded me of Molly Weasley, honestly, because it's like this, this caring and nurturing and comforting mother, and then verse 14 comes in, and it's, you shall see and your heart shall rejoice, your bodies shall flourish like the grass, and it shall be known that the hand of God is with her servants, and her indignation is against her enemies. And I was like, oh yeah, not my daughter. <laughs> like, going after Dollar Tree. Like, it is perfect. Molly Weasley as God in this particular <laughs> passage. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and then jumping into the verses, in verse 10 we read, Rejoice with Jerusalem and be glad for her, all you who love her. Rejoice with her in joy, all you who mourn over her. And so in the Bible, uh, Jerusalem, the city, is often spoken of as a whole separate character unto herself. Not just in the way that people will say that, say, New York City or Chicago have a personality. Uh, I have to say, <laughs> being from the area, Chicago has several personalities. That's what the neighborhoods are. <laughs> <laughs> but it, as though the city itself is actually a, a full-on person. And that reminds me a lot of how sometimes Star Trek will talk about certain spaceships and also in DS9, the space station. None of them quite to this level. They will all give the, sh the ships and the space station personalities, sort of. Except for in the Voyager episode Alice, uh, in which Tom Paris sort of falls in love with a space shuttle. I would say it makes more sense in context. I'm not entirely sure that's true now that I think about it. Uh, but the, the space shuttle actually sort of becomes personified. Uh, it's complicated. And thankfully, it turns out that the city of Jerusalem is way less manipulative than that, that space shuttle was. So. <laughs> and then in verse 12, we read, For thus says the everlasting God, I will extend prosperity to Jerusalem like a river, and the wealth of the nations like an overflowing stream. And you shall nurse and be carried on her arm and dandled on her knees. And this is like, okay, the government should care for the people, right? Wealth is, in this framing of it, care for and nourishment for everyone, which is what we're talking about, right? Like ownership of labor to the people, but also the government should be of, for, and by the people. And therefore, care from the government is the care from the people. Um, in very clear contrast to, for example, the capital in the Hunger Games where wealth is hoarded among the few and ex like that's, I mean, it's where we're headed, but it's also like even more extreme. There's yeah. as little as the middle class is now. There's no middle class in the Hunger Games, I think. And yeah, yeah don't hoard wealth or something. <laughs> I, I think Jesus would be in favor of that. Sure. Yeah. Actually, the entire Bible. I was just say the whole thing is like... <laughs> yeah. That's Isaiah for sure, but most of the prophets like were upset about yeah. economic injustice. A lot of the prophets would turn into R2-D2 about that on our show if they came to visit. Right. But, yeah. It's true. They would definitely become R2-D2. <laughs> we did do an entire episode of our deep dive was on biblical cussing back in September. Oh, so. Yeah. That was awesome. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> yeah. That's I'll... Cool. I'll link to it in our episode description, but there is there is some good cussing that happens in the Bible, but it's not it's not what we think of it. Like it's not right. Contemporary Imagining cussing. different words, right? Like yeah. Yeah. we just don't know that those are translation cussing. is a thing, yeah. right? Because heaven forbid we allow the original languages to have the power that they should have. But right, yeah. Our second reading is Galatians chapter six possibly verses 1 through 6, and definitely verses 7 through 16. As Paul finishes his letter to the Galatians, he reminds them that they will reap what they sow, 
and gives some suggestions for how to include those in the community who continue to follow Jewish ritual laws. So one of the things that comes up in this passage is conflict and the process for doing conflict at the beginning of this passage is very like Great British Baking Show style (laughs) (laughs) as opposed to like any United States based (laughs) cooking competition. Right? Like, it's not super cutthroat, try and sabotage each other. It's like, be kind about it. I love Great British Baking Show because everybody wants to be the best, but they all want to be the best among other people who are doing their best. Your potatoes are being replaced with box mashed potatoes. (laughs) That's that's U.S. uh, cooking shows. Yeah. Yeah. The U.S. ones are just like, uh, no. But I also think about like the dynamic and the implications for this in terms of like organizing, mm-hmm. because a lot of the time organizing is pointed to as, as like you're causing conflict, you're disrupting stuff. But the reality is that organizing is about bringing conflict that already exists into the open so that it can be addressed. Yeah. And that like dynamic of like challenging the power of money with and the abuse of power with money, uh, with people power, right? Like, so it's just like, there are so many ways that sometimes the Bible is misused to say, to to blame the victim, right? To blame Mm -hmm. workers for causing disruption, protesters for causing disruption. But the reality is like, I mean, the ELCA did this with a statement on the abortion ruling. Like it was in general, a statement that said, abortions should be free and accessible and legal but there was also this like caveat about violence and discouraging violence and it's like no the violence already happened like Mm -hmm. this decision is violence yep let's not distract from that yeah yeah i mean that's something i was thinking about a lot yesterday and just like that dynamic of like what like justified and unjustified violence and state violence is always justified apparently and then in As we dive into the verses, in verse 7 we read, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for you reap whatever you sow. Which is another way of saying, there are consequences for your actions. And I think right now, with the number of billionaires, right, we're seeing people who think that they are above consequences. Who think Mm -hmm. that they will continue to reap what they have not sown, or not reap what they are sowing. And we're in the fall of capitalism and the fall of the climate, and no matter how many rocket ships Jeff Bezos makes, he cannot actually, like, money cannot actually buy his way out of climate destruction unless it is money spent to address the destruction of the climate. But, Mm -hmm. yeah, do not be deceived. And Elon Musk would be having much more of an impact if he was, you know, treating his employees with justice and... Mm -hmm focusing on actually helping the climate rather than on making tons of money by creating terrible vehicles that break but yeah or imagine if we had trains right that's i wish we had the the train infrastructure that like europe in particular has and public transport yeah under trump i did not want that to be created because the reason that europe has as good of as it does especially in germany is because of hitler so i was like not about it under trump but like well, not to mention, given the way that most of Trump's businesses went, I don't think Trump trains would have needed <laughs> anything other than a lawsuit yeah. and bankruptcy. But yeah. Also true. Also true. But like now, I'm like, yes, can we finally get better train systems? Yeah. 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 And then in verse 11, we read, see what large letters I make when I am writing in my own hand. And, you know, now that we're talking about labor justice, I'm thinking to myself, so Paul obviously had a secretary for at least some of his letters. And gee, I wonder what he paid that person. Uh, But apparently in this bit, he was writing it himself uh, for a change. Perhaps he had terrible handwriting. I don't know. I mean, he also might have been like had some sort of some amount of blindness is also Yes, or maybe some kind of a uh, difficulty with his hand Mm -hmm. uh, that made writing difficult, who knows. And this made me think of, uh, I've read a fair number of Deadpool's comics, as uh, a few years ago I had the money to have an e-book comic uh, comic subscription for a while. And uh, not for quite a while now, but it was interesting while it lasted. And one of the lesser known facts about Deadpool is that he has truly gorgeous handwriting. Hmm. (laughs) 
if if you run across a note that he's written in the comics, uh, he has this really beautiful, very elaborate cursive uh, that you would not expect. And uh, I just found that interesting because there are so many little details about him that make him such a more interesting character. Um, and in case any Marvel bros are listening, I will also point out that he is really obviously pansexual. <laughs> and if you missed that, you were not paying attention while Dude. reading the comics. I've only seen uh, he will flirt with a lamp post. That. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of people seem to miss the little details about him that make him interesting, and, and I enjoy pointing those out. Yeah, So, and we will link to something. Uh, yeah, there's an article that we can link yeah. to uh, uh, that illustrates literally his handwriting uh, in one of the comics. And then our gospel reading for this episode is from Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 11 and 16 through 20. Uh, Jesus sends out the 70 in pairs to share the news of his arrival and heal the sick. After facing some difficulty and much success together, they return to Jesus, rejoicing, and he reminds them to not glory in the power they've been given, but in their everlasting life. So one of the themes in this passage is the idea of preparing the way, right? They're going to all the places that Jesus is thinking about going, and sure. then part of it is that they'll report back of like, this is in fact a great place to go, or maybe not. <laughs> yeah. And organizing really right gotta lay the groundwork i was thinking about it and i was like this is really easy to make a colon like to make this about colonization right it's Ooh, really yeah. easy particularly because of christianity's history of colonization to be like Ugh. but it also feels different mostly because this is taking place under an empire right there is a roman empire that is the colonizing force and Jesus is decidedly not the colonizing force in this actual context. So then I was thinking about it, and it reminded me of Moana, which is, of course, one of my beloved Disney movies, because <laughs> I am that kind of person. And yes, there is currently a Moana soundtrack in my car right now <laughs> in the CD player. <laughs> but like, she is preparing the way for her people to return to the sea as part of like not colonizing, but that this is part of their culture as a seafaring people and mm -hmm. accidents happened that made them afraid of an aspect of their culture. Mm -hmm. And so she is like breaking out into this again and then preparing, even repairing the harm that was done so that it is again a place that her people can, can go and can explore and can continue to live within their cultural framework. Which I really like. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess I just started thinking of like migration patterns and how they were impacted by colonization, mm -hmm. like you know, for for generations here, um, and really the the concept of borders and how you know the enforcement of those borders um, essentially ended so much of that, in at least in the way that was done for you know generations. Yeah. Yeah. That's I love the native land ca native-land.ca I think we'll link to it but it has a map of like where you can figure out who the original inhabitants of the land were who the indigenous tribes of the land were and I mean obviously you have to have like clear edges but there's overlap and there's like concentric circles and Venn diagram type things because the borders are like black pen black ink lines we drew on a piece of paper they're not actually reflective of the land and the places and the people and the animals that move around it mm -hmm. yeah love that yeah and then in verse four we read jesus instruction to carry no purse no bag no sandals and greet no one on the road which speaking as an introvert is a dream it is an introvert's dream <laughs> Greet no one on the road. The number of times, like, there are, there are pastors who talk about, like, when they travel, they just, like, naturally, people are drawn to them to talk to them. And I'm like, no, I'm putting headphones on whether or not they're plugged into anything. Because <laughs> we need to know that I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> and so, of course, then it's followed by verse 5, which is whatever house you enter, first say peace to this house, which is, like, my nightmare, right? Like, I don't want to go into a strange house and be like, peace be with you. Can I stay here for a while? Yeah, I'm not the door knocking kind of pastor. <laughs> Just not who yeah, I am. Yeah. 
And then we jump into verse 8, which reads, Whenever you enter a town and its people welcome you, eat what is set before you. Uh, and on the one hand, <laughs> this is a great way to accept hospitality and to be willing to broaden your horizons. On the other hand, I think Jesus is also up for some very common sense practical restrictions to this kind of thing. <laughs> like, for example, there is a very early episode of Stargate Atlantis. I couldn't figure out exactly which one. I think it's the one where the genii are introduced, where there's a team of people who go on a diplomatic mission to a, a new planet, a new gate, and they follow this rule, only they didn't get to ask what was in the food first, and one of them, mm -hmm. Rodney, uh, has a deathly serious allergy. And his teammates don't necessarily believe him about this allergy, to begin with. Um, and then the actor, David Hewlett, uh, did a great job of portraying the look of, am I about to die of anaphylactic shock terror, <laughs> as he reluctantly eats this food while not knowing if his allergen is in it. Because presumably he probably has an EpiPen with him, but also they're on a, you know, literal different planet, and who knows how long it would take him to get real medical help. And so that was uh, an interesting moment. So, like, I think Jesus is okay with you making sure that you're not your allergies are not going to be triggered uh, before you yeah. eat that's probably fine but also you know you don't need to get judgmental about whether you're being fed brand name foods or anything either so balance in all things yeah. i i thought you were going to talk about the cookbook cooking man or something isn't that from this episode? oh the, to serve man is an episode of the twilight yes Channel. <laughs> yes in that case also uh, that that would also be be good you know knowing what's in the food before you eat it is a reasonable yeah. thing to ask i, I agree uh, refusing to eat it because it's not you know up to your snooty standards is a completely different conversation 100%. So. Yeah. <laughs> although uh <laughs> young me would have would have uh, not been um in agreement with 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 us I, I was a lot a lot a lot of pickier as a child <laughs> yeah yeah most of my pickiness could usually be ass assuaged by just having all of the food slightly separate on the plate okay. as long as that was the case i could eat most things so yeah. oh, i always wanted like a bowl everything in a bowl right on <laughs> each other but i had like certain things that i didn't like because of texture and that was like yeah, a no same. a non-starter yeah mm -hmm. yeah I still don't understand why people eat cottage cheese. Like, I understand they do. I just, why would you do that to yourself? But That's way are, better than mushrooms. Uh, see, mushrooms have wonderful flavor Fine to them, and gross. you can also, like, cook with them in a way that you don't deal with the texture at all. did have some mushrooms yeah. yesterday, I'll be honest. Didn't have cottage cheese. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm with you that mushrooms, like, flavor-wise, can be great. But if you make me eat a mushroom where I can, like, feel the texture, it's not going to happen. <laughs> See, a portobello burger is actually very fun for me, but <laughs> not as an everyday thing, but occasionally. Speaking of singing vegetables, <laughs> our newest segment is Let's Make a Muppets Musical. So, Ali, if you were to cast a token human or a Muppet in any of the readings or other readings from the Bible or whatever in an organized oh my gosh can you imagine like casting muppets as like an organizing team like newsies style or something where you're like <laughs> the original newsies though yeah. I, I i am a christian bale kind of girl see it's it's been a bit right since but for some reason i don't know why but um like <laughs> oscar just gives me like union guy vibes oh, oh my gosh that. yes so yeah, like put, he would be a rep yeah like bring him into any like any of these and like i think that would i think that would work well he would be an absolute rules lawyer who would know every <laughs> trick in the book and would uh fight for yeah and like just glory in the ar argument yeah i've said this before but yeah. i when i was a kid had a stuffed animal oscar the grouch like puppety thing and so like <laughs> Oh, I have a special place in my heart for Oscar the Grouch, and now I want, like, yeah. or, like, Oscar the Grouch, like, so in the gospel, right, could be one of the, like, disciples getting sent out, but also mm -hmm. could be, like, one of the, could be right outside one of the houses and be like, hey, <laughs> you do deserve to get paid. Come on in. Yeah. Or, like, mm, yeah. nah. Okay, that's going to be a t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Well, and like I was looking at the gospel reading and thinking to myself, so Jesus sent out the 70 in pairs, partly I'm sure for companionship, also for safety. And I was thinking about the Muppets and some of them break up naturally into pairs, but those might not be the pairs you'd actually want to send out together. Like from Sesame Street, Bert and Ernie, like Ernie would really want to go with Bert. Bert would not want to go with Ernie, right? But I think Bert could go very well with like, say, Rolf from The Muppet Show, uh, because I think Rolf would appreciate Bert's like attention to detail and practicality and all and would have the personality that would be you know laid back enough to deal with Bert's nitpickiness whereas Ernie would probably love to go with Elmo Ooh. and would have the patience to deal with Elmo's millions questions and they'd have a great time together uh, whereas you know if you tried to send Bert with Elmo things would get set on fire like there's no way out of that right yeah so or like Miss Piggy would absolutely want to go with Kermit and Kermit may or may not agree with that but uh, we've also seen in the original Muppets movie that Kermit and Fozzie Bear uh, make a wonderful traveling couple mm -hmm. and they would have a good time working together too. So, like, let's be imaginative when we send people yeah. out in Paris. So who would go with Big Bird? Oh, I, you know, <laughs> I, I guess Snuffleupagus would be my natural inclination for Big Bird and I think they, they also work together pretty well. But I also have this wonderful urge to have Big Bird go with someone very, very small. I was gonna say, what about Julia? that's just my natural Julia? inclination of Oh, that would be lovely. Yes, I, I think Big Bird and Julia would, would get together very well. But I, I do love the image of Big Bird, you know, carrying someone as his traveling partner. That that, that would be adorable. That would be very and sweet. Yeah. I think Big Bird and Julia would be great together. Absolutely. Yeah. They both have the right kind of patience for each other, I think, from what I've seen. I don't know Julia that well. But... <laughs> I don't either, but from what I've seen, yeah. So, Alejandro, uh, any other thoughts on life, the universe, and everything? I think a lot is changing in mm -hmm. various ways mm -hmm. i'm a pretty optimistic person somebody has to be right <laughs> and i i'm seeing as we were talking about earlier different affinity groups mutual aid efforts develop in my neighborhood you know mm -hmm. and yeah. folks not getting completely shut out of the conversation for like having wanting to have these conversations yeah for instance, I'm running for office, and mm, say more. I have, uh, yeah, <laughs> so I'm running for state senate here in a, a pretty handedly blue district. I'm running independent, mm, sure, largely because I, I think, especially a lot. Of, I mean, I live in neighborhoods that don't where the the party, the Democratic Party, kind of feels like ownership over our votes because it's almost a guarantee for them. Uh, mm, so yeah. they don't really invest in even going, you know, turning out the vote in these areas because to them it's a guaranteed, you know, win. Republicans don't even run, not viable in this area. And mm. I think any other year or, you know, prior to 2020, there, an independent campaign wouldn't be taken seriously. And like the folks that have been helping me have been doing a lot of really great work. We've been able to literally say what we want and yeah. loudly. Mm -hmm. and it get attention from like journalists and stuff in a way that isn't like dismissive of like the movement that's happening and you know kind of show that like you know regardless of what happens in November like there is and we've seen as with Indira's campaign which I see that Emily has an Indira sticker on their bottle but it's true. Um, <laughs> And, you know, a lot of the same neighborhoods um, that, that would be voting for me in November, voting in this election in November, um, that are, yeah. regardless of it, if it's because they agree with what we're saying or because they are tired of the system that, 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 that they're under or being forced to vote in a certain way um, or only given two options or given one option. And, you know, I think we're doing a lot of great stuff and they're kind of forced to take us seriously and i think mm -hmm. that largely it's because of the work that other people have been doing and because a lot of folks have been doing so much to make sure that this conversation didn't stop whether it was in regards to capitalism whether it was in regards to police um or whatever it is um that that folks are have been um you know 
in, in conflict with and in, in, in battling for for a long time, um, but many of whom recently got involved within the last few years. Um, I, I think that so many folks have been doing so much great work, and it, we're at the point where they won't be able to keep ignoring it in the way that mm-hmm. they have for, for quite some time. And, and I think that that's going to manifest itself in, in really interesting ways. I don't know exactly how, but I know that we're going to be able to have these conversations more and more. And I think that that does pose some more threats of violence against us, and folks will be arrested um, for vocalizing mm-hmm. what you know, what we're saying. Um, And I know that like putting myself out there in this way as saying the things that I'm saying, you know, is maybe not this, I don't know if it's like, if my uh, safety is uh, being threatened um, and so on. But, you know, I also know that that is realistic to think that either like the the state or just other like, like folks and, you know, people here in Des Moines that disagree with me or that think I'm whatever their imagination uh, or their their image of their imaginary monsters exactly whatever they want to to you know throw at me as a non-binary person as a person of color as a you know radical leftist whatever (laughs) whatever they want to cling on to to like demonize me and you know, want to enact violence on me and my community, I know is a threat and something that we have been seeing. And it's, it's scary to think about. I mean, even an event that we're hosting today, you know, I've been concerned about like what that's going to look like. And I don't want to have to be concerned about that. I don't want to have to know that like, oh, we're putting on a drag show today, uh, an all ages drag show. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it's, but a big part of like what I'm so frustrated about with the Democratic Party and with leadership in general is that they're not willing to be like fighters for us. Mm-hmm. They'll tell us behind closed doors that they support immigration reform or that they support immigrants or that they support trans lives and then they make statements saying that it's not it's a non issue to voters and that that's what's important. And winning elections and such and if they're not willing to say it, then we need to have people that are like, whether it's running for office or just using whatever platform they have access to, to loudly advocate for uh, folks who are, you know, actively being like harmed. Mm-hmm. Um, then, you know, I and, and I do see that we are seeing those folks step up or find whatever avenues they can to advocate or to challenge, you know, the, the, the status quo to to like enter predominantly white spaces um, you know pr- you know white led reproductive justice spaces and say hey we actually have to be centering um, these voices and mm-hmm. um, you know the way that 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 um, these conversations are being framed are, are actually hurting a lot of us too and um, it's been really great to see that it's been scary in some in some instances but I think that it's it's going to be really helpful to to continue to see how that impacts you know the next generations and and i'm already seeing it i'm excited plus you have awesome tie-dye shirts which i'm excited to someday get in the mail for your campaign so yes like all of the like clear and like serious and all of that stuff but also tie-dye shirts (laughs) yes 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 and just all kinds of events you know we're doing like a community fairs and like soccer tournament next weekend i mean like early talks of doing a dungeons and drag event like a virtual like dungeons and drag that sounds amazing yeah hopefully that develops into something but you know we've i've had several conversations i think we'll do it but it'll be you know like twitch kind of thing maybe i'm not sure exactly but yeah I'm excited yeah sure. that sounds like really great like it is, it is a reminder that community organizing, yes, is very serious and, like, can be an actual, like, threat to life and mm-hmm. livelihood. And also, like, if you don't have moments of fun, you will burn out. Yeah. Like, but we mm-hmm. are all so burned out from the pandemic and from ongoing violence and by police and climate change, all of that stuff that, like, to have as part of, as integral to your own campaign space for fun is so beautiful and so like refreshing yeah Love it. it's it's great and people are resonating with it and are happy that there are you know more accessible events or just mm-hmm. things that are like you know coming to folks in 
spaces they know versus expecting them to come to me or mm-hmm. expecting their vote or thinking that if you know you know I guess shaming people for not wanting to participate in a system that isn't engaging with them yeah and so it's it's been it's been really rewarding that's awesome yeah well thank you for being with us this has been <laughs> such a great conversation yes, and thank I am you. and dear listeners thank you for joining us Catch us next time when we'll discuss nerdery connections to the scripture readings for the fifth Sunday after Pentecost. This podcast has been produced by us, Emily Ewing, and Kay Roloff. For more fun, check us out on Twitter and Facebook at Nerds at Church, or contact us at nerdsatchurch at gmail.com. Also, if you like what you've heard, rate us or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Facebook, or wherever you catch your podcasts. If you want access to our uncut guest episodes and interviews, live Q&As, and more, support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash nerdsatchurch. It's cheaper than a lawsuit about wage theft? For sure. Way cheaper. (laughs) Also, let us know on Facebook or Twitter who you would cast for Let's Make a Muppets musical for this episode. As the ancient Christian said, Pox Pox Obiscum. Obiscum.